Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Juana Summers, and I'm a reporter for NPR, where I cover demographics and politics. I am super excited to be here, and thanks to the University of Chicago and Cook Political Report for letting me jump in and moderate what I hope is going to be a really awesome conversation with some folks who I think are going to really be able to cut to the quick and give us some real insight into the intersection of polling and our incredibly diverse electorate. Um, off the top, I'm going to introduce them to you. Um, Fernanda Mondi is the principal of Bendizen and Amandi International, which is a firm that specializes in multicultural and multilingual public opinion research and media communication. Professor Kathy Cohen is the David and Mary Winton Green Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science here at the University of Chicago. She previously chaired the Department of Political Science and the Director of the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture. Terrence Woodbury is a Democratic pollster and a founding partner at HIT Strategies, where he conducts market research to understand people of color, millennials, and women. And last but certainly not least is Matt Barreto, who is the co-founder of the polling firm LD Insights and founded the Latino Politics and Policy Initiative and Voting Rights Project at UCLA. He's also directed polling and focus groups on Latino voters for years, including for Joe Biden. He's also polled for Hillary Clinton. Um, so just to start us off, I'm going to have everybody take a couple of minutes um, to share some of their thoughts about this conversation. Then I get to do the fun part as a journalist and pepper them with a bunch of questions. So Fernand, I want to start with you. Yesterday, when we were chatting about this panel, one of the points you were making to me was that you wanted to talk about one of the biggest mistakes that pollsters make when they are polling Latinos. Well, thank you so much for uh, not only the intro and the question, but I also want to reiterate my thanks to uh, the University of Chicago Institute of Politics, and of course, the Cook Political Report, and my fellow panelists for participating, because this is a fascinating conversation. I'm always gratified in the interest that comes when looking at uh, voters of color, in particular Hispanic voters, because when I got, got started in this about 25 years ago, there really weren't panels like this. Uh, it really wasn't on the political radar as much. And I think it's because of the explosive growth of communities of color, but in particular, we see the Hispanic electorate, the fastest growing electorate in American society. It is the very interest that we're seeing with panels like this and the role that they could potentially play in electoral contests, particularly in a polarized nation where outcomes are very much decided by one or two percentage points. It is that interest that is creating, I think, challenges, Juana, for our industry when it comes to the most critical deliverable of what we can offer. Uh, and that's accuracy. Uh, again, I've been doing this for the better part of close to 25 years. The firm that I work for, Ben Dixon and Amandi, we are the pioneers of when it comes to multicultural polling in the United States with, I think, the expertise in the Hispanic marketplace above all. And I use that word marketplace very specifically because when you're looking at the Hispanic population of the United States, oftentimes it's okay if you are off by a percentage point or two, maybe even three when, when what's known of margin of error when doing broader market studies, right? But when you're looking at that in an electoral context, when you're looking at how Hispanic voters are indicating their preferences, particularly in key states where we know they could be determinative in the outcome, the demand for polling that we see and the cost of polling has I think led some to, to look and maybe take some shortcuts that we have to be very careful to, because at, at the end of the day, they get to the question of accuracy. And accuracy is what matters most in our profession. I think all of us would agree with that. So what do I mean by that? Uh, according to APOR, the gold standard in a recent converse, conference that I attended was still, when it comes to conducting public opinion studies with Hispanic voters, it's still the live operator telephone interview. And that's because the penetration of the telephone is still almost universal. It's not ever going to be 100%, but it's still in that 98, 99 percentile range through a combination of either uh, cell phones, which are certainly where the majority are today, and also landlines as well. Not as much as certainly generations ago, but still present. And in addition to that, in the telephone, you need bilingual operators in real time, people that have the ability to speak, switch and speak to a maybe foreign-born Spanish dominant interviewee, because if you don't have that, you have potential blind spots that lead to accuracy concerns. 
And while certainly this is a challenge for all of us in this industry, because there's a push to go online and do more online polling, what I have found is it is not as accurate a metric and a measurement in capturing the full spectrum of Hispanic voter opinion, because the digital divide is still somewhat pronounced with Hispanic voters, particularly those that are older and that are foreign born and Spanish dominant. And that leads to potential accuracy questions. So how does that translate into the real world? Give you a quick example. Uh, in August of last year, in collaboration with the Miami Herald, we did a study of Miami-Dade County, which is one of the most Hispanic uh, heavy voter counties in all of the United States, of course, a very political county. And in that study, we showed that not only was Joe Biden underperforming significantly with Hispanic voters, we showed that that underperformance was really jeopardizing his possibilities of, of winning the state of Florida. And there were a series of studies all around the country, a whole other folks that, you know, suggested that while Biden had been doing poorly, maybe he wasn't doing as poorly as as our studies indicated. But nonetheless, when we saw the election results, it was borne out. And I think one of the reasons why is because of the need for accuracy in polling, which is always, I think, the gold standard. You have to have the most precise, accurate results. And that's how you develop the credibility to be able to prognosticate in an electoral context. It was imperative to us that we continue that gold standard of live operator telephone polling. Now, there is going to come a day very soon, perhaps maybe even in less than 10 years, where you will no longer need to do that. But I think all of us, when asking the question, how do we make sure the full balance, the full perspective of Latino and Latina voter opinion is reflected in the polling that's put out there in an electoral context, I think we always have to be very careful to resist the economic pressures and temptations to maybe sometime take some of those shortcuts that I think lead to blind spots and then don't provide that accuracy of opinion, which we then can look at results. And I think one of that area was also in the estimation for the support of Donald Trump with Hispanic voters, where we saw much higher than a lot of folks, I think, even thought possible based on what was being tracked at the time. But thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to asking a lot, answering a lot of these questions uh, as we go forward. Thanks so much. Professor Cohen, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you next. Sounds great. Um, first of all, thanks to the Institute of Politics, Cook Political Report for the invitation to participate in this. Just to prove I'm a real academic, I'm actually going to use slides, you know, in case anybody, uh, <laughs> in case you weren't sure, here you are. Um, I want to do maybe three quick things with, I think I have like maybe five minutes. The first is move to the right slide. Uh, is to talk about what Gen Forward is and why we exist. And that's why I'm here, not because I'm an academic, because I run a survey uh, project called the Gen Forward Project. And then I wanna hopefully illustrate very quickly some of the nuance we're trying to uncover when we're thinking about young people uh, with a few data slides. So first kind of what is Gen Forward? It's a bi-monthly survey of 18 to 36 year olds, right? Which includes millennials and Gen Zers. It's nationally representative, so it's both probability and non-probability, but the non-probability is weighted. What's I think really important for us is that it has over 3,000 respondents and uh, lots of oversampling of African-Americans, Latinx, and Asian-American young adults. And so that allows us to disaggregate by race as well as a number of other identities. Two other quick points is because we're on a regular schedule, I think we can be kind of current and topical. Um, and we're trying to kind of root our questions in the lives of young people, largely young people of color, with the goal of, we talk about kind of correcting or narrative shift about young adults, especially young adults from BIPOC communities. I, you know, I could talk all day about why young adults, largest share of the workforce and eligible voters, even though the turnout isn't at the same rate. But I think in many ways, it is the diversity of these generations that we're trying to pay attention to and to leverage, right? They're the most ethnically and racially diverse generations. And when we do just a generational approach, for example, millennials versus baby boomers, we flatten out those differences. And I think we miss what's really happening internal to those generations. Um, and the other thing, and I'm sure Terrence will talk about this also, which is that the centrality of uh, these young people to many of the issues that confront the country are usually not represented in an accurate way um, in terms of policy and political debates, and we're trying to center them. 
you know, we say this is what democracy looks like. And when we're representing the public, which we often do with polling and the media, right, we want to make sure, in fact, that their voices are included. So let me give you a couple of data slides to talk about what we mean by nuance and narrative shift or correction. I think, for example, in the wake of the, and I will call it the execution of George Floyd, we saw young people take to the streets. We saw many people, but largely young people take to the streets. And part of that narrative was that in fact, consciousness had been raised, people were outraged and they were moving into the streets. We know that however, since 2016, when we started asking the question about what's the most important problem facing this country, for young African-Americans, it has always been <laughs> racism, right? systemic racism. And so while undoubtedly um, the execution of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and we could go on, right, confirmed their understanding of themselves as secondary citizens, it wasn't triggered at that point. And in fact, if we don't have a kind of body of research and data on young people, we miss the, the correct narrative. I'll give you another example. When we ask this question about how serious is, is the killing of of black people by the police in the United States. And we've asked that since 2016. We know that for young folks of color in our survey, the majorities have always said, in fact, this was an important issue. It was really only for young whites in the summer after the mobilization that it became an important or you know, issue for them. And so I think we have to have nuance in terms of thinking about how this, these generations, millennials and Gen Zers, think differently based on race and income and gender and not flatten out our understanding. One more example and then I'll, I'll, well, three more slides and one more example. Part of what came out of the summer was this idea that in fact, we should begin to discuss the idea of abolishing or defunding the police. And I wanna say that um, if we ask a simple question like the one that we did, we get an answer that says majorities of young people, young adults don't wanna abolish or defund the police. But in fact, if we begin to ask different types of questions, we get another level of nuance. So if we ask about supporting or opposing a new agency of first responders specializing in de-escalation, again, we see majorities of young adults saying yes to that question. If we ask a question about divesting from the police departments, either their entire budget or part of their budget towards something, investment in areas such as healthcare, again, we see near majorities agreeing with that issue. So I'm gonna stop here, but to emphasize what we're trying to do is to center the voices of young adults to in particular pay attention to issues that matter to young adults of color, to ask these questions in multiple ways to produce nuance. We are, of course, we understand the importance of voting um, and the predictive of voting, but we also wanna understand how young people live, which issues are most important to them and how you move them based on an agenda and not just an uh, kind of appeal to go out and vote. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks so much, Professor Cohen. Um, Matt, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Juana. Uh, it's great to be with uh, you. And um, thanks, Fernand, for welcoming uh, all of us and, and acknowledging Chicago and the others. Uh, I won't have to go through that now. So I'm glad you did that. And, and just to agree with, with that for bringing us together. Uh, these panels are increasingly common now. Uh, but they weren't, uh, as Fernand noted, uh, many um, decades ago. And so it's, it's great to be having this discussion, especially with such a, a great group and hosted by a great group. Um, so I'll talk and follow up on a couple of um, items. I think sample and methodology is critically important. Um, there is a debate right now, and that is something that needs to get addressed. Uh, the first is that you know across uh, both 2016 and 2020, um, there were a lot of uh, polls. Polling is now um, widely uh, reported on in the media and um, not all media report on all polls. And there's a reason for that. Um, there is wide ranging uh, accuracy issues with sample and sample selection. And what we really want to think about is, are we giving all uh, voters, regardless of their race or ethnicity, an equal chance to participate? Uh, or are we systematically excluding voters of a certain race or ethnicity? Uh, and that's why uh, we advocate for, and I think the polls that you see that are the most accurate are mixed mode. Um, it is definitely the case that if you are operating for an adult uh, Hispanic sample or an adult uh, African-American sample, an online only poll 
will miss some of those folks. While the digital divide is narrowing, uh, it isn't gone. And you will miss some of those folks if you are doing that. Many of the polls that get reported in the news um, are 100% online. But a very important point, very important point, is that not all online samples uh, are equal. There are about um, at least 30 different online uh, source vendors. Uh, there's really hundreds, but about 30 that you might be able to use. And amongst those 30, there's wild uh, fluctuation in their uh, coverage rate and in their non-coverage bias. And so these are things that need to be investigated before anyone goes in is to making sure that we have an accurate sample. Uh, I will disagree a little bit with uh, Fernand in saying, I, we continue to use live caller. We think it's critical, but not 100% live caller. You run into the inverse problem on the other end of the spectrum. And that is that Kathy can talk about it in her sample. Many of these folks in the 18 to 29 and maybe even up to the 18 to 39, but in particular in the youngest sample, the 18 to 29, which is our single largest demographic in the Hispanic electorate. It's our single largest uh, age category, uh, 18 to 34 is they will strongly prefer uh, to take a self-administered uh, survey, whether it's on their smartphone, tablet, or phone. And if you only offer a live caller that you have to pick up your phone and put it to your and talk, some of those people aren't going to participate, not some of them, large numbers. And so we don't want to exclude them. We want to make sure that they feel welcomed. And it is still possible today to randomly select respondents directly off the voter file and offer them in online self-complete if they desire that. And so we try to think about it in terms of sample, not necessarily mode, making sure that we're not um, doing anything to systematically exclude anyone. And this is an important uh, discussion debate that needs to take place for the future of polling in order to get it right, uh, to make sure that as you're uh, incorporating these additional components, uh, that you're doing it accurately, that you're doing it scientifically. Um, there have been numerous um, randomized control trials on mode uh, where respondents are randomized to take the survey on the phone or given a, a, a link to the internet uh, where uh, respondents are selected from different samples. Uh, and those are informative on, on what and how we should be adjusting our samples moving forward. The bottom line is that when you collect the data, you wanna make sure that it is reflective of the community. Uh, in our case, uh, as Fernand was indicating, you wanna make sure that you have the right percent immigrant that you have the right percent second generation children of immigrant, that you have the right percent Spanish dominant, and then you have the right percent English dominant. You need to make sure that that resulting sample that you are uh, informing either just the general public and media or clients of is reflective of the community uh, that you're studying. And because polling methodology has been shifting so dramatically in the last 10 years, I remember we were having the same debate about 10 years ago when people were deciding how many cell phones should we call. And at the beginning, there were people hesitant. Oh, no, don't call cell phones at all. That's, that's not accurate. We have to go in and uh, examine this data in order to get it uh, more accurate. So that's the first. And I hope we can continue that discussion because it's very important. We, we want accurate uh, data to tell accurate stories of all of our uh, communities. Uh, but for some reason, it seems more critical in getting the sample correct in Black and Latino communities as well as Asian American, which are growing uh, in size and importance in many of these key battleground states. Uh, in terms of some of the shifts, there's no question that we saw a shift in the Latino vote uh, this cycle as compared to 2016. Um, and, but that wasn't uh, universally felt. Um, you know, I think in some ways, if there had been uh, a different you know, time zone map across the United States, if there had been a different reporting calendar, uh, I always challenge people to think, what would the narrative have been that developed so much on election night if uh, Arizona had closed first? If the first news we saw was a massive increase in the Latino vote and turnout numbers in Arizona were, were incredible and very high vote shares uh, for uh, the Biden-Harris ticket, really uh, cinching Arizona for the Democrats was the growth, just that turnout growth in the Latino vote as compared to what we saw develop as the Miami-Dade numbers came in, which were a significant shift uh, from 2016. So we wanna think about each state, each community differently. You know, the large Puerto Rican population in Philadelphia and across the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania uh, came out very strong and in high numbers for um, the Biden-Harris ticket. Uh, across spots in Texas, we even saw within a state, we saw very, very high performance uh, for the Democrats among Latino voters in places like San Antonio and Dallas, 
Uh, but setbacks, uh, decreases in places in South Texas and Laredo and Brownsville and McAllen. So people who are in this uh, profession, who are in the, the business of, of polling and talking to Latinos, knew a lot of these things going in, were talking about them, but they didn't get the coverage until now. And so that's one of the things that I think is exciting and provides an opportunity that we can unpack and understand the Latino electorate in a much more diverse lens than simply quote the Latino vote, the Hispanic vote. We know that we need to understand the different communities um, and to segment in the same way that, that white voters have been segmented for so long that we should segment and understand uh, these voters uh, through those different uh, means and lenses. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, that's what we're trying to do with our data. And that's the reason accurate data is so important. Um, I'll leave it there, turn it back over to you, Juana and Terrence for, for the, the closing openings. All right, awesome. Terrence, I will let you go ahead and bring it home and then I will pepper you all with a bunch of questions. Thank you so much, Juana. Thank you to all of the fantastic panelists here. Thank you to the University of Chicago Institute of Politics and Cook Report for having me. Um, I'm a huge fan of everyone's work on this panel, so I'm honored to be here. Uh, and, to, and to learn from and learn with all of these panelists. Uh, I, I named all of our post-election, uh, um, you know, our, our, our post-mortem presentations, we've been doing quite a few of them, pain and power, because I really do believe that that is the context of the 2020 election. We saw tremendous pain in communities of color, <clears throat> tremendous pain amongst, uh, amongst young people, but also uh, we, saw, we, saw, we saw them uh, overexert uh, the same communities that, that, were, that were experiencing this pain. We saw overexerting their political power in ways that, that, that lent to historic turnout. Uh, I'm Terrence Woodbury, a partner at Hit Strategies. Uh, we focus on a couple of communities that we, that we think are, are grossly underrepresented in politics, minorities, millennials, and Gen Z, as well as women. Um, we started the company to, 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 to do a couple of things. One is to change how data is collected, to diversify uh, the way that we reach people, um, and, to, and, and of course, to, to continue relying on the conventional uh, uh, landline, uh, live phone callers, but to also um, uh, innovate the way that we are reaching people. And so we also, we do a lot of online polling. We do a lot of text to web polling. Um, reaching millennials and Gen Z in the palms of their hands where, uh, where, where they spend the most of their time on their cell phones. Um, but also even social media targeting to, to, to start capturing some of these audiences that are grossly underrepresented um, in, 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 in traditional collection. Change how data is presented, to change who data is collected from, again, making sure that it's more representative, change how, how the questions are being asked, asked and to change who is asking the questions. I, I like to, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I'm the oldest person at Hit Strategies. We have a young and diverse uh, team of researchers that really do live and work at the intersection of where uh, some of the greatest change is happening in the electorate. And so, uh, you know, uh, recruiting, training, and, and, and empowering these young researchers to change uh, even the way that we're asking questions to be more representative of the communities that are often underrepresented. Uh, so why were the polls wrong? First of all, you know, we, we, we wanna, at, at the end of every election cycle, uh, everyone on this panel is, um, is often tasked with defending the entire industry, should polling even exist? You know, the fact is the polls were not, were not wrong. Um, the, the, if, we, if, we, if we start to, uh, to really understand how to read and understand polls, uh, the polling errors are actually getting smaller uh, across the battleground states. Only two or three states were actually outside of the margin of error. <clears throat> and we have some theories about what's going wrong in those states under, uh, uh, um, under representation and, uh, and response bias. Uh, but also, you know, the 2020 election was unlike any election we've ever had. Modeling turnout was, was, was near impossible to get to what would be the likely electorate. Um, it, is the, it, 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 is, it is representative in the fact that, there, that some demographics, Black seniors um, <clears throat> in particular, had reached their 2016 turnout before election day. They had already exceeded 
their 2016 turnout in some of these same battleground states. And so modeling the likely electorate was extremely difficult. Uh, Trump supporters have lower levels of social and institutional trust and therefore are inherently less likely to actually answer polls. Once the people that are less likely to respond are, are, are uh, inherently different than those that are responding, then we have uh, an increased response bias. And that's exactly what we saw here. Um, by, Biden's lower support with voters of color was missed by a lot of polls. This is why, uh, uh, to many of the, uh, of the previous panelists points, we have to start disaggregating. Um, got, you know, POC in a cross tab uh, or even disaggregating black or Latino or AAPI in a cross tab because the gender and generational differences in communities of color is, 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 is significant. And that is where uh, a lot of the, you know, Trump's support amongst people of color and that, and that shift that we saw in 2020 uh, was being underrepresented because, because people of color were reduced to a single, a single uh, uh, column of the cross tab or, or even worse. Uh, late deciders began, broken, uh, began breaking for Trump in the last, um, <clears throat> in the last week of the election uh, fit by, by, by five points. And finally, the media coverage of polls is significantly more wrong than the actual polls. We could talk a lot more about that. Uh, a couple of things that are going wrong uh, uh, that, 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 that we have to correct for. Uh, when we ask the wrong questions, we get the wrong answers. One example here is amongst millennials. Uh, if you just look at this left column, Amongst millennials, we, you know, uh, if you ask the question to rate the following issues on a scale of zero to 10, and one of your issue options is cost of college education and student loan debt. Well, millennials and Gen Z are a big diverse uh, 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 voting block now. And so uh, the, when you ask a double barrel question like college education and student loan debt, well, amongst this, amongst this diverse electorate, there are different priorities. For someone like me that graduated 10 years ago, but has almost six figures of debt, one of those is a lot more important to me than the other. But, but if you ask a double barrel question, you miss that. Another example of asking the wrong questions is, is, is one that, that uh, Dr. Cohen brought up earlier. When you, when, you, when you give a list of issue priorities and far too often conventional polling does not even include systemic racism as an issue priority but it is the number one priority of young voters, a top three priority of young voters, a number one priority of black voters, top three priority of AAPI voters, top three priority of, Latin, uh, of Latino and, La and Latina voters. And so if you are omitting a top priority altogether, then, <clears throat> then you're asking the wrong question and you're getting the wrong answer. Uh, finally, these demographic groups are not a monolith. Again, we cannot reduce African-Americans to a single column. We cannot reduce Latina and, 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 and Latino voters to a single column. God forbid, we definitely cannot reduce them all to a POC column, which I have seen in many cross tabs, because this is the variance that we see. Again, when we just ask to, to, to rate your, your number one issue priority, uh, it, could, it, it could be misleading if you look at just the total column here, because when you look at younger, uh, younger black men, they prioritize uh, gun violence. But when you look at younger black women, they, they prioritize uh, 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 economy and uh, economy and healthcare. If you look at college educated voters, uh, they, they prioritize racism and discrimination. And this is just amongst black voters under the age 40, you have this level of diversity. And so we have to continue to disaggregate these diverse populations to understand the diversity of their opinions. And finally, these groups are a mobilization target and not just a persuasion target. This from uh, 2000, uh, post 2016 focus groups that we did with third party voters, where I asked them uh, if, you, if, if, the, if you could have a do over, again, this is after the election, after the consequences of Trump were real and, and apparent. Um, if you could do the 2016 election over again, uh, how would you vote different? And 60% of them, this is just amongst third party voters, 60% said, they would vote third party again. And it dawned on me at that point that this was not just a mobilization target, but in fact that we had to, uh, to, to begin an, uh, understanding and analyzing their priorities different in order to, to, to move them into the column that we wanted them in. And I'm happy to jump in and start uh, getting peppered with questions, Warren. 
All right. Well, thanks so much to all of you. Um, the first thing I want to ask is jumping off of a point that Matt made about the ways in which folks um, between the ages of 18 and 29 prefer to take and respond to surveys. We know, and Kathy, you've touched on some of this as well. We know that Gen Z, it, which is now aging into our political system, is the most diverse generation ever. Future generations will continue to reflect that diversity. So for any of you, whoever wants to start us off, I'm curious if you can talk about how you think our methodologies could and should change to reflect that diversity and to make sure that we are accurately reaching young people. And Kathy, I saw you just unmute yourself. Well, I, I figured I'll start and, and I know my colleagues will jump in. I'll say a couple different things. One is, you know, I, I keep trying to say we have to push away or at least add to the generational frame, right? There's a kind of uh, enticement at, in particular in the media of comparing generations, baby boomers versus millennials. Generally, what you get in that is an overrepresentation of white young adults, and you get the flattening of, of these generations. At the same time, I think, to Terrence's point, when we talk about communities of color, or if we talk about African Americans, we're not paying attention to generational differences, right? So, you know, part of what I would say is disaggregate, disaggregate, disaggregate. A, a third point, I'll make four points in now. So a third point is the kind of under, I would argue, investigation of young whites, right? And I, I think there's an interesting way in which we recognize diversity, but we also don't pay attention to the kind of changing or even troubling aspects of some of the things we see in terms of public opinion of young whites. Um, we have a whole thing that we talk about is kind of white vulnerability, racism, the ways in which we see young whites saying majorities um, that whites you know, face the same types of discrimination as minorities. Now, this is something that we've seen in older populations, but I think people thought that there would be this generational change and we wouldn't see it in young whites. And in fact, the tiki torque, tiki torque, tiki torches of young whites in Charlottesville also show up in the data. The last thing I'll say is to this point of mode, we offer, for example, uh, over the phone um, taking of our survey, 95% of young people who are in our sample want to take it online, self-administered even over the phone or sometimes on a laptop. So I think change, and, and we also use a cell phone uh, data. So I think changing up how young people um, have access to this, but also thinking differently about the sample and what we're trying to get at in terms of you know, an intersectional analysis um, that allows us to disaggregate is critical to, to moving forward in terms of polling. You know, I, 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 I'll jump in here as well. I, 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 I don't think we can emphasize enough the need to, to begin disaggregating these communities. You know, uh, it, is, it is, is often perceived, I, I think young voters are often perceived as more progressive, more democratic leaning voters. Um, when the truth is, they're just, it's just a more diverse population. That in fact, young white voters are not that much more progressive than older white voters. There's just less of them in the electorate, right? That 60% of, of white voters under the age of 40 in Georgia voted for Donald Trump, 60%. Um, and so we, we do have to start exploring why it is that, uh, that young white voters who agree with us on many of the issues um, are still voting for Republicans up and down the ballot because that is, that, that is gonna be the, um, the, 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 the path to uh, the, 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 the demographics destiny that, uh, that a lot of progressives and Democrats are hoping to achieve. I'll make a quick point just to the original question about methodology. I I'm less dogmatic about mode because one of the things we've learned over the years is it doesn't matter if you're talking to an 18, 29 year old over the phone, online or via carrier pigeon. As long as they're represented in the sample, they're gonna give you their same opinion. It's not like it's different whether it's done you know, over the phone online. Sure, it's a little bit easier to get them but I think the question then becomes, what are you doing to ensure what is fundamentally the most important thing in opinion research, particularly electoral opinion research? And that, I come back to the issue of accuracy. If accuracy is not the gold standard and utilizing methodologies, sure, but making sure you have the representative proportionate group and then the universe represented there, and then you're undercutting accuracy, then I think that's where you lead to problems. Because it doesn't matter how many technological innovations one has, if accuracy is not the gold standard, you know, then 
you undermine the very confidence of what it is all of us are trying to do, which is give and project precise results before, during, and after the fact. Um, the next thing that I, I, I'd like to ask about, as a reporter who covers demographics and politics, something that I think went a little unappreciated, and I know that one of you all mentioned this, I can't remember who, was the growth and the power of the AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander community. Um, and those are folks that often we don't see representation of in a lot in a lot of the polls, at least that I certainly consume this cycle. And I'm wondering if you all can talk about how you think the growth of that demographic will change, how polling needs to change to reflect the growth of that demographic as we move forward. Let me just jump in quick because, you know, we've done so much work in this area and, and it's similar to what we see with Hispanic voters. You know, unlike most African-American voters, there's not the language divide as much you know, with that you see with Hispanic voters, but with AAPI voters in a lot of cases, particularly if you're looking at certain communities, the Hmong community, for example, in, in the state of Minnesota, you've got a huge Vietnamese community in, in other parts of the country, in California. You also have to do that multilingual polling component because then otherwise you risk the blind spot of only getting the acculturated English dominant second and first generation US born that don't necessarily share the opinions of their elders. So again, we come back to the original gold standard that I talked about. We cannot necessarily take those shortcuts in costs. It may mean doing more expensive polling because you need people that speak Hmong in English, uh, Cantonese and English, and be able to switch back and forth, Japanese and English in some cases, if you're looking at the growth of the AAPI community. And, and, and unfortunately that's the consequence, but I think it's so important because as you said, it's also a rising vote in the United States. It's one of, <clears throat> I'll add, you know, just a few thoughts there. It's one of the fastest growing. It's faster growing as a percentage than the Latino electorate. Um, and it is growing in critical states. Uh, yes, it's large in California. There will influence many congressional districts, as we know in Orange County, uh, in the south of Bay Area, um, but also in places like uh, Nevada. We saw a huge discussion in Georgia uh, this year in many battleground congressional districts in Texas in Houston and Dallas, you know, huge and growing uh, communities there. The Asian American community is about 70% foreign born amongst uh, eligible voters. And that is um, almost double what the Latino community is. So we think of the Latino community as a heavily immigrant community, uh, but it's only coming in at about maybe 35%. So at 70%, all of these concerns about inclusion are more critical in this electorate uh, because uh, it is more heavily foreign born. And as Fernand said, there's probably at least five or six languages that you have to be ready to field in if you wanna get that uh, accurate sample. And, and so we don't even see, you know, cross tabs. Terrence made this point earlier. You, you almost never even see AAPI disaggregated as a group, let alone That's right. Korean voters, um, Indian, South Asian voters, and, and we really need to see that to understand the future of the electorate in many states. That's right. And, and one of the reasons that's so important is because uh, along with the tremendous growth of the AAPI vote, which we saw double in many battleground congressional districts, specifically even in Georgia, uh, in Georgia 6, where they could be uh, accredited with the victory of both Joe Biden and both, um, both Democratic senators, but they're also the highest swinging ethnicity. Um, uh, uh, on, on the partisan divide, right? Where, where black and Latino and white voters swing from election to election by less than 10 points, oftentimes less than five points, the AAPI vote can swing more than 20 or 30 in a single election in the same district. And so these are real swing voters that we really have to understand um, in order, to, in order to, um, to, to, to move their votes one way or the other. I just want to also agree with that. I mean, we include an oversample of a API, but our sample is largely English based. Now, part of that is also generational. Okay. Um, but one of the things that we know is also these are young people who have been racialized, who in many ways have a very progressive stance. And so we are, this is a place where kind of generational differences, it seems to me, are critically important. And again, uh, thinking about kind of language as a both barrier and an introduction of bias into, our, we know into our sample is something we're always trying to pay attention to. 
we're going to jump over to audience questions in a couple of minutes, but I want to ask one last thing, and this is a question kind of about resources and staffing. To the extent that we have seen some flawed or misguided polling of people of color in this country, I, I wonder how much of that do you all think is a function of not of not having more people of color in the room or at the table being in charge of these polls? Juana, let me, let me just jump in on that one because it's, you're, you're speaking my language, as they, I like to say. You know, it, it's, it's a big problem because not only do you oftentimes not find people that understand these communities at the table and making decisions on how to ask some of these questions, sometimes they don't even speak the language. I, I cannot imagine trying to design a poll for the Hispanic marketplace, the Hispanic population, the Hispanic electorate in the United States, if you don't speak both languages, you know, in English and in Spanish, because there are oftentimes cultural uh, distinctions that happen from uh, the ability to understand the language and think in, in real time. And I know it's a complex concept, but we see it bear out over and over again. And, and that's why I come back to this point, and, and I'll, I'll make maybe a little controversial position here. You know, you want to see our industry, and maybe even those in the media, and you, you play a role here in FP, NPR and others, you want to police the results because for again a pollster accuracy is everything it's kind of like you know a sharpshooter you want them to be accurate if you're a sports fan you want your quarterback to be very accurate because if not you're not going to get to the super bowl and i think we need to do a better job of self-policing ourselves when there are bad polls out there or bad pollsters that continuously get things wrong i think those need to be called out because the problem is we all lose and the industry gets a black eye and as i argued in the waning months of the 2020 election polling and accurate polling that the population has confidence in is extremely important to democracy because you need Americans and you need people to trust that when you're doing a study, it is scientific and it is representative and you need to have all of those voices at the table and making those decisions who understand their communities better than others. I'll, um, I'll add to that. One of the issues that's hard to police is, and you know, I think you know, Fernand would agree that, you know, Nate Silver tried to do this with his grades. He gave grades to different pollsters. He gave them different weights. So there was some sort of public place that you could look. People are not looking at that. And today we have, you know, a new poll will come out in Florida and it'll get five headlines if it comes out, you know, three weeks before the election. No one has ever heard of this polling outfit or it's brand new. So there's about a hundred different places producing polls and reporting those polls in 2020, that's going to continue in 22 because people want data. They want to know what voters think about their issue. And so there's going to be more and more polls commissioned. And there does need to be some sort of uh, analysis of the different methodologies that people are using, especially for that sample inclusion. Is it accurate? And that I, I think Silver attempted that and he started to get down that road. Um, but they started just looking at how closely you, you hit the bullseye at the end. And sometimes you could have a completely terrible sample, uh, but it cancels itself out in some ways and it looks accurate at the end of the day. It's not, it's not, it was lucky. And what we need to put that emphasis on, I think is more of the methodological training. There should be, um, you know, additional, uh, in-depth discussions of different modes, sample selections, you know, are people selecting people through DM on Instagram? Um, I mean, we need to be selecting people where they are. And that is how you get an accurate sample. And so I'd like to see that debate in the academic world where Kathy and I are uh, for parts of our, our careers, those things are happening, but they sometimes take one year, two years, four years, right, mm -hmm. Kathy, to unfold. Yes. And to Fernand's point, we need that data quicker and sooner in the real world of politics. Can I just jump in Matt's point? I think this final point about the academic versus private industries, I guess, is in the academic field, right? You have a responsibility to release your data so that people can take a very close look at it so that they can use the data and so that you can answer to kind of the difficulties and problems in the data. And I, I don't think that is the case, right? And 
private industry. There's a lot of money to produce polls. There's much less, I would argue, accountability other than maybe not using that pollster again. We, we live in a world where we put all of our data up on the website within a year. Anyone can use it. You can all download it. Um, and we feel like that offers a level of accountability. But again, I'm not a private pollster in that same sense. So I do think there are these questions, whether it's grading or making some data public or, or you know, making complete your kind of field report, but there has to be some level of accountability to answer for bad, what we're calling bad polling, which is about accuracy. I agree with Fernand, but I also think that it's not just accuracy, it's the way in which you understand communities, it's the contextual understanding. And are we asking questions beyond predicting if people are going to go and vote as opposed to understanding how they're thinking about political and public issues? That's right. And if, if I and just to, the last thing on this point is, <clears throat> um, while I do think that there needs to be some enforceable accountability on the industry, um, some standards, some industry standards set that are, are that are agreed and enforced, uh, there also has to be some accountability in how polls are reported. Um, and this is this is a lot of the challenge here is that is that media outlets, especially in the 24 hour media uh, media cycle, are, 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 are just in desperate need of content and a moving ticker a percentage point during a primary, you know, in a long primary where things aren't changing every day, but they got to make news every day, a moving ticker where a percentage point moves one or two points. Well, to a pollster, that is a statistical, um, uh, uh, there's no difference. Statistically, there's no difference. But in a, in, a, in a news cycle, it's easy to say Elizabeth Warren is gaining steam and that's a headline for a day until the next poll comes out with no accountability on, who's, on who conducted the poll, on the accuracy or legitimacy of the poll. And there has to be some more accountability to that because the media has a responsibility for how they're distributing this information. As much as I would love to have a long conversation with you about our role in this issue, and there's certainly a lot to say about that, we're gonna move on to audience questions now. And this first one comes from, and I'm probably gonna butcher this last name, so sorry, um, David Konevsky from 3D Research. And David asks, um, with increasing levels of interracial marriage, how do you account for multiracial voters and how their racial identity may change over time? Kathy, you were nodding so emphatically, so I'm gonna throw this one to you first. Okay, okay I'll be quick. I, I think this is a question, right? It's always a question about the complexity of measuring race and ethnicity. I mean, when we say that someone is African-American, you know, what exactly do we mean by that? We're largely using self-identification, giving people a long list of possibilities, also including quote unquote mixed race um, or biracial, and then allowing people to identify what those races are. But it, 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 it becomes very difficult. And I think what people often do in the analysis is, you know, uh, you focus in on those people who have identified one racial category as a way to easily classify them. And we miss, right, um, the ways in which there's a kind of intersectional analysis, even around race and ethnicity. So I think it's things that we have to work on, but those are the mechanics that we use. Can I, can I just piggyback on Kathy? Because I think she's absolutely right. You know, you have to do self-identification, but there's another element and you know, I, I say this as a Cuban American, so I get to I get to criticize my peeps a little bit. Uh, Cuban Americans don't think of themselves as Hispanic; they think of themselves as white. So, you sometimes, if you just ask self-identification, you know, the media has these categories. What do you identify with? And you give them a choice of black, Hispanic, white, or other. They'll say, "No, I'm white." So then you got to then follow up. Well, what country were you born in? If you weren't born in the United States, and you say Cuban, then we have to go back and recode. So I don't know if that's an example of systemic racism eking itself into the into the data, but I'll tell you what, self-identification is critical because without that, you have to go by what people say and then do that second degree of sub-analysis. We see this all the time, and it's also uh, a pronounced in different communities as well, including the Asian American, the AAPI community, but based on studies we've done all over the country and even in Asia and themselves. So it's always a fascinating little bit of a dilemma there. Can I just jump back in uh, just to that point, which is, I, I think, right, we want to be careful about going with how people understand themselves. So we have the ability to do some analyses. We have an ability to say, you know, are, are individuals who identify as Cuban, but also identify as white versus Afro-Cubans different politically, right, in terms of both their consciousness, the ways in which they think about policy, and how they engage with the vote. So 
you know, all of these self identifications across race and ethnicity, race and nationality should allow us to be kind of uh, investigators of the complexities of race. But I think often we're trying to produce reports that that means that we kind of don't pursue everything that we could. Thank you. I'll pop in here because we've only got a couple more minutes left and I want to get to a bunch of questions. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to kind of play traffic cop here and say we can have just one person answer each question so we can get through a couple more. Um, this next one, Terrence, was directly asked for you by the questioner. It's from Brett Cooper. And he is asking about whether racial or age subgroups make a differentiation between racism and systemic racism in their survey responses. And I think what he's kind of getting at there is how you account for different definitions of racism in the respondents. Uh, you know, when we ask about systemic racism, it is it is often self-defined, right? Like uh, we, we often ask about perceptions of racism, about personal experience of racism, about the priority of racism. And it is often self-defined. You know, one thing that Kathy pointed out was uh, was that amongst young white voters, the urgency um, the, the, uh, of, 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 of correcting systemic racism began to rise over the summer of 2020 after the protests. Um, one that we characterize as, as the, the, the movement evolving from black people versus the police to a movement of young people versus racism. Because the, the protests were, while they were racially and ethnically diverse, they were 89% under the age of 50. And so we do see some evolution um, uh, 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 around issues of race, even amongst AAPI voters who around the, around the summer of, of the protest experience were expressing higher racial anxiety than African-Americans because of the, uh, the um, xenophobia associated with COVID-19. And so we see evolutions around issues of race amongst all demographics, amongst all ethnicities, but also amongst different generations that we have to continue to disaggregate and understand. All right, Matt, I'm going to tee up this next one from you. It is from Harry Golan at Rice University who asks, are subgroups like Vietnamese or El Salvadorian Americans just such a small percentage of the electorate that it becomes prohibitively expensive to create samples large enough to include cross tabs on them? Uh, smaller groups are always harder to include cross tabs on, but they're politically relevant and important. And so you want to think about the community that you're pulling in. Um, I know I can speak uh, as an example to the diversity of the communities in, in uh, Miami, uh, and I think I've seen this in, in a lot of Fernand's work as well, you know, not just dividing out uh, Cuban and non-Cuban, uh, but trying to look in and go into um, South American groups uh, there. You might be interested in learning the differences between Colombians and Venezuelans. Colombians might be much more uh, persuadable and open and, and lean Democrat and Venezuelans, as we know this year, uh, were very heavily targeted. That's important to know. It's important to bring that out, even though their uh, Colombians are two to one larger in size. We still want to do that, but it's hard. I might only have, you know, 58 Venezuelans in a regular sample. I might need to oversample them. And so, when it gets to the same with Central Americans, uh, there are some pockets in Los Angeles, in um, Virginia, where you do have a large Salvadoran population, uh, and you would you would want to oversample them. Uh, that again gets to sampling methodology. How do you target them? You know, you can't find with Vietnamese, there are surnames, uh, but with Salvadoran, they're gonna have almost certainly the same uh, surnames as Mexican Americans who might live uh, nearby. But uh, unfortunately, typically those groups are lost, but I think with projects like the ones that the four of us are discussing, we oftentimes do try to oversample and increase because that is critical. It's critical to understand and, and learn what's happening in these different communities, whether we're talking about the difference between Vietnamese and Chinese in the AAPI, or Venezuelan, Cuban, Colombian, and Puerto Rican in the state of Florida. Um, this next question is from Craig Kafura at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. And Fernand, I'll let you take this one. Um, Craig asks, given the emphasis on disaggregating demographic subgroups this morning, do pollsters need to change the standard nationwide 1,000 person sample? You know, it's, it's, it's a good question. I'm not so sure, depending on who the pollster is that's doing the work. I mean, I, I hate to come back to the idea that all, not all polls are created equal because they're not. But again, we have found that with a thousand person sample, even an 800 person sample, as long as you are looking at the representative nature and assigning the proper weights and balance to the universe targeted and making sure that they are in there, 
uh, I don't really see a need to deviate from the science of the sample size. Now, it's also very situational. It depends on where you are doing some of your studies. And I think Matt and, and Terrence alluded to this a little bit of, a, a bit ago. If, if you're looking at a certain state or even a certain city or a certain region in a certain part of the country, yeah, you may need to have significant and much higher subgroups represented because then that will be a blind spot that will give you a false read uh, in terms of the final analysis. But nationally yet, I'm not quite there to say we need to, to, to dis disaggregate all of those numbers as long as you have the representation of each of the communities in there and the whole proportion to what they look like in the electorate. And then quickly, I'm going to lightning round you guys on this last one. So short answers here to the extent that you're able with such complex material. Someone has asked, what is the biggest surprise for you during the 2020 elections as it relates to polling and demographics? And I'm going to pick on Terrence and have you start. Uh, it was the generational gaps amongst Black voters. You know, I think we were starting to see some of the gender gaps that men and women were not only turning out, but voting for. Uh, Democrats and Republicans very different, but we saw the same thing amongst younger and older voters. That younger voters who are seen as more progressive were much more likely to support Trump than their senior counterparts, and that's something we still have, we still have to understand. Who wants to go next? I can jump in. Um, I think um, maybe more attention to the ticket splitting that happened. Uh, you know, we had a fairly decisive at the top of the ticket. Uh, win for the Biden-Harris ticket, expanding the, the raw vote margin uh, over um, uh, Clinton in 2016. But we saw some defection down ticket. And so understanding what happened, not just in communities of color, but across the board, was this a Trump-only phenomenon? Were, pe were, were there were enough pe people so um, ready to vote against Trump, but they, they defected down ticket uh, to try to you know, really pick that apart? Georgia really is the bright spot where we saw that unified voting, but in many other states, you know, there was a lot of discussion of the state legislature and, and congressional seats in Texas, California lost congressional seats back. Uh, and so unpacking uh, what happens when someone makes that decision to vote for president, to vote for senator, to vote for house or, or state house, we need more work there. I think that the presidential election really uh, overly consumed attention this cycle. Democrats got their ass kicked down ballot in Georgia too. Just Warnock and Ossoff kind of uh, just uh, distract from that a bit. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Re real quick for me, I'll just say in terms of voting blocks of color, it was men. Uh, Hispanic men, black men, and AAPI men caused me some many sleepless nights as I was looking at raw data saying this can't possibly be true. Uh, but it was, and I think that's the other lesson. You've got to separate all of the noise of what the past tells you sometimes and look at the new data and, 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 and regard it carefully because you may be seeing a brand new trend open up. And I think we saw that much higher support for Trump than I ever would have thought possible mm -hmm. from Hispanic men, black men and AAPI men. That's right. I was gonna say the exact same thing about gender and in particular masculinity, right? So if there are ways to think about how masculinity appeals to certain men and not other men in communities of color, I think that would be a, a way to kind of layer on and nuance our understanding of what happened in 2020. I mean, funnily enough, if you had if I had asked myself the same question, masculinity probably would have been what I would have landed on to. I think it was just so noticeable this cycle through survey data, anecdotal data, the time that we were able to spend on the ground talking to voters too. Um, that about gets us to time. So I want to thank the panel, Terrence, Kathy, Matt, Fernand, for sharing um, sharing your experience with us. This has been a lot of fun, um, folks. I hope you do not go away because Dave Wasserman is going to bring your really awesome panel. It's about methodology and the media with Cornell Belcher, Nate Cohn, Ashley Kurzinger, and David Shore. So stick around for that. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>